1976, Stephen Spurrier was operating a wine shop in Paris. He enjoyed featuring up-and-coming wines in his store, and he had recently been to California and was very impressed with a number of the wines, including lots of wines from Napa Valley. He ended up purchasing about 30 of those wines and brought them back to Paris, and then he subsequently arranged to have a tasting competition. There were two different categories of wines that were tasted at the blind tasting. One of them was a red wine category, and that was based on Cabernet Sauvignon wines, and there was a white wine category as well that was for Chardonnay. The red wine category included six wines from California and four wines from Mr. Spurrier's cellar, all of which were from France. Examples included the 1970 Mouton Rothschild and also the 1970 Alprion, so certainly very stiff competition for the California wines. The white wine category likewise featured 10 wines, six of which were Chardonnays from California, and four of which were white burgundy from Mr. Spurrier's cellar. The white burgundy included the very costly and prestigious Batar Montrachet, so certainly an impressive white lineup to compete with the California entries as well. At the time, the French wines were certainly dominant and widely considered to be the very best wines in the entire world. In contrast, Napa Valley and California wines generally were not even a blip on the wine radar screen. So this was very much of a David versus Goliath fight, and the French judges totally expected that the French wines would dominate and that the California wines would be outclassed. Even during the tasting, for example, one of the judges tasting a Chardonnay would say something like, this is obviously a California wine because there's absolutely no aromatics. Well, as it turned out, that was the very expensive Batar Montrachet, which finished a disappointing 7 out of 10. And in fact, in the white wine category, it turns out that the California wines had three of the top five entries, including the overall winner, which was the 1973 Chateau Montalena Chardonnay. At that time, the Chateau Montalena sold for a mere $6.50 per bottle, which was a small fraction of the cost of the white burgundies that it beat. Likewise, the California wines did well in the red category also, with the 1973 Stag's Leap winning the overall red category and narrowly edging out the 1970 Mouton. So the fact that Napa Valley won both the white wine and the red wine categories definitely showed the world that Napa Valley was the source of world-class wines, and this led to an avalanche of investment in Napa Valley. While winemaking traces its roots in Napa Valley way back to the 1830s, and there were more than 140 wineries by 1889, the industry was devastated by events like phylloxera, the Great Depression, Prohibition, and also two world wars. While there certainly were some wineries that were operating throughout this time period in Napa Valley, it was really the tasting at Paris that allowed Napa Valley to achieve widespread recognition and which led to the dramatic growth that would follow. To its credit, even Mouton got involved as the owners of Mouton Rothschild teamed up with Mandavi to create Opus One, which had its first vintage in 1979. Napa Valley became an American Viticultural Area, or AVA, back in 1981. At that time, it was the very first AVA from California and only the second in the United States. Napa's not just one monolithic area, however, and in fact, there's 16 different sub-AVAs that are also sometimes called nested AVAs. Napa Valley is quite complex, and the growing conditions can be dramatically different in these different sub-AVAs, and this has a dramatic impact on the resulting wines. We'll be discussing that in more detail shortly, but before digging into that, a factual overview is instructive. Napa Valley has a Mediterranean climate that's ideal for the production of high-quality wine. Unlike Bordeaux, the vintages in Napa Valley have historically been quite consistent. You may have one vintage every 10 years or so that's a little bit more cold and rainy, but in general, the grapes are able to get ripe vintage after vintage quite consistently. A bigger risk, especially more recently, is the risk of smoke taint from fires. So there's been lots of fires, such as those in 2020, that devastated much of the vintage in Napa Valley. There's more than 40 different grape varieties that are planted in Napa, and grapes planted for the production of red wine account for around 80% of the plantings, 
and white only about 20%. Of course, Cabernet Sauvignon is king, and that counts for around 52% of the plantings. There's a big drop-off after that, with Chardonnay being second at only 13%, and then Merlot, which is around 9%. Currently in Napa Valley, there's around 475 physical wineries and about 700 grape growers. But to better understand Napa Valley, it's definitely helpful to use a map. Napa Valley is located between the Napa River, the Vaca Mountains that are to the east, and the Mayacamas Mountains to the west. The Vaca Mountains help to shield Napa Valley from the hot air that is in the Central Valley. Likewise, the Mayacamas Mountains helped to shield the valley from the cold Pacific breezes that would otherwise come in from the west. But Napa Valley is open to the south and does definitely receive some substantial cooling influences from San Pablo Bay. Napa Valley is very long, about 30 miles long. There's also substantial differences in the elevations for the vineyards due to the influence of the mountains. So you could have vineyards planted anywhere from sea level to 2,600 feet above sea level. And so the fruit and the resulting wines will vary dramatically depending on things such as the proximity to San Pablo Bay, the elevation of the vineyard, and also the aspect of the vineyard. For example, the AVAs to the south are particularly impacted by San Pablo Bay. As the vineyard temperatures rise in the afternoon, hot air rises and pulls cool air and fog from San Pablo Bay up through Napa Valley. This results in fog in the late afternoon that continues overnight and into the following morning. And so there's definitely less sunshine and cooler temperatures in these areas that are impacted by San Pablo Bay. Los Carneros is heavily impacted by San Pablo Bay due to its close proximity and is also the recipient of marine influence from the Petaluma Gap to the west. As a result, temperatures in Los Carneros rarely get to even 80 degrees. And I was there last year staying at a winery guest house, and these afternoon breezes are no joke. While it was sunny in the day, the wind definitely picked up, and it was extremely cold once the breezes started. As a result, while Cabernet is king, most places in Napa Valley, in Los Carneros, you're definitely talking about a lot of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay due to these cooler temperatures. Coombsville also has substantial impact from San Pablo Bay, as the average daily temperatures there are around 10 degrees cooler than most other AVAs in Napa Valley. And in Oak Knoll, the temperatures can be as high as in the 90s during the day, but then they fall dramatically once the afternoon fog and cooling breezes come in. So there's definitely a substantial diurnal range in Oak Knoll that's attributable to the San Pablo Bay influence. <clears throat> As you move north up Napa Valley, San Pablo Bay will have progressively less influence, but certainly Yountville is a big beneficiary, just like the Oak Knoll District is. So in Yountville, you'll definitely continue to have a substantial diurnal range, with a big difference between the daytime and the nighttime temperatures. While Yountville is justifiably famous for world-class dining, such as the French Laundry Restaurant, there's also some outstanding wineries located in Yountville, such as Dominus. And if you look to the east, you'll see the Stag's Leap District. Stag's Leap is described as a valley within a valley, and its wines are aptly described as being like an iron fist in a velvet glove. This is so because while there's some cooling influence from San Pablo Bay that results in cooler nighttime temperatures and which helps to preserve acidity and freshness in the wines, there's also a number of hilly slopes from the Stag's Leap Palisades that radiate heat to the vineyards throughout the day and which help to ensure that the grapes get sufficiently ripe. While there's many top wineries in the Stag's Leap District AVA, two of the most well-known include Schaefer and, of course, Stag's Leap. If you're interested in wine recommendations, wine collecting strategies, and learning more about wine, please do subscribe to my channel. I've been collecting wine for more than 15 years and also have a Level 4 diploma from the WSET. So I have both formal certification as well as substantial practical knowledge from the School of Hard Knocks. Continuing to head north up the valley floor, once you leave Yountville, you'll come to Oakville and then Rutherford. These areas will be progressively a little bit warmer and still have some impact from San Pablo Bay, 
but certainly not as prominent as the impact to the areas to the south. The Mayakamas range is particularly high here as well, rising up to about 2,400 feet. And this is significant because it casts afternoon shadows beginning at around 4 p.m. And so a number of the vineyards in these AVAs can receive some shade and cooling influence in the afternoon when it's otherwise quite warm. The soils in Oakville and Rutherford are also critical and help to produce some of the most well-known and highly acclaimed wines from the valley floor. The Rutherford Bench is a long stretch of gravelly alluvial fans that are located in the base of the Mayakamas Mountains. Despite the name, the Rutherford Bench extends into Oakville, and in fact, this is the area where you'll find some of the most famous single vineyards in Napa Valley, including Tokalon, Heights Martha's Vineyard, and many others. In general, wine that's made from fruit that's grown on the Napa Valley floor will be more approachable and have a slightly softer tannic structure than wine that's produced from mountain fruit, which can be a little bit more structured and have tannins that are more grippy than the valley fruit. An example of that is many wines from Rutherford, which definitely have a softer texture to them and which are often described as having a finish that's characterized by Rutherford dust. Just north of Rutherford, you'll find the St. Helena AVA. The St. Helena AVA tends to be a little bit higher in terms of altitude, and it ranges from about 200 feet above sea level to around 475 feet above sea level. There's relatively little influence from the cooling breezes in the fog when you get to St. Helena, but what you'll find is that the valley here is quite narrow, and so you do get some warming influence from the hills radiating sun in the afternoon. As such, it does tend to be a little bit warmer in the St. Helena AVA. There's dozens of top producers in St. Helena, and one of my personal favorites is Spotswood. The Calistoga AVA is at the far north end of Napa Valley. Here it tends to get hot, and it's not uncommon for temperatures to exceed 100 degrees or more. Nevertheless, temperatures can be as low as in the 40s at night. This is due to the fact that Pacific breezes have a substantial cooling influence and are funneled to the Calistoga AVA through the Chalk Hill Gap. Due to the warmer temperatures here, in addition to Cabernet Sauvignon, you'll find great varieties like Syrah, Petite Syrah, and Red Zinfandel. One of the more prominent producers located in Calistoga is Chateau Montalena, the victor of the white wine category in the 1976 Paris tasting. The growing conditions in the mountain AVAs in Napa Valley are quite different from what you'll find on the valley floor. As a result, the wines are also much different. Most of the vineyards in the mountain AVAs are located above the fog line. As such, they don't have the lack of sun exposure once the fog rolls in, and the nights tend to be warmer than what you'll find on the valley floor. As such, there's less diurnal range. Nevertheless, in some of the mountain AVAs that are located to the south, such as Mount Veter, you can still get some cooling breezes from San Pablo Bay. Mount Veter tends to be the coolest of the mountain AVAs, and in fact, when I visited last February, it even snowed on me during my visit. So certainly there's a number of top producers in the Mount Veter AVA, but one of my favorites is Mayakamas. Mayakamas is known for producing very age-worthy, structured wines. If Mount Veter is the coolest of the mountain AVAs, Howell Mountain is undoubtedly the warmest. Howell Mountain is located in northeast Napa Valley, and it has virtually no maritime influence at all. The vineyards are located above the fog line, and as such it gets quite warm here. One of my favorite producers in the Howell Mountain AVA is Dunn, which is known for producing wines that can age for decades. The Spring Mountain AVA is on the northwest side of Napa, and here it's generally cool to moderate in terms of the temperature, but a lot of that will depend on the elevation and also on the aspect of the vineyards. In some of the cooler areas, for example, with north-facing vineyards, you can even grow some white grapes, such as those for Chardonnay and Riesling. But there's certainly plenty of Cabernet Sauvignon that's being grown as well. Interestingly, Spring Mountain also borders Sonoma, and if you visit Pride, you'll find that some of its vineyards and winery are located on the Napa Valley side, and others are located in Sonoma. Like Spring Mountain, the Diamond Mountain AVA is also located in northwest Napa Valley. 
Elevations here range from 400 to 2200 feet above sea level. This is a moderately warm AVA and it's well suited for the production of Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Diamond Creek is probably one of the better known producers from the Diamond Mountain AVA. While Pritchard Hill is not formally recognized as an AVA, I would be remiss if I did not discuss that outstanding area in this video. Pritchard Hill is actually a term that was trademarked by Chapelet, and so you won't see it on any other labels other than Chapelet bottlings. Nevertheless, this is an area that's located between Lake Hennessy and the Atlas Peak AVA in the Vaca Mountains. Elevations range from 700 feet above sea level to around 2,000 feet above sea level. This is an outstanding area with many top wineries producing outstanding wine. Examples other than Chapelet include Colgan and Bryant Family and many more. As a general rule, a lot of the wine that you'll find grown from mountain fruit tends to be a little bit more structured and it can have more grippy tannins than what you'll find on the valley floor. In many instances, it will benefit from some additional age and also have a longer lifespan than some of the wine that you'll find from the valley floor. I definitely recommend that everyone who visits Napa Valley visits both wineries on the valley floor as well as some vineyards in the mountain AVAs so that you can taste the difference between some of the valley floor fruit and the mountain fruit. And so you can also get the benefit of some of the stunning views and scenery that you can get from some of the mountain vineyards. Just like grape growing conditions vary widely throughout Napa Valley, winemaking styles do as well. There's some classic producers, for example, that are still making wines in the classic manner that they've used for decades and which still have wines that are in the 13% ABV range or so. There are still a couple of producers, including some that make highly publicized best-selling wines that are making wines in the style made famous by Robert Parker and which tend to include the use of high percentages of new oak, lots of sweet ripe fruit, and some lower acidity. But in general, I find that the vast majority of producers from Napa Valley in the past five or eight years or so have definitely scaled back on the use of new French oak, and many of those producers are using maybe 50 to 70% new French oak today, where in the past they used to use 100% new French oak, and in some instances, I even knew of producers who bragged about using 200% new French oak. In addition, many of the producers are picking their grapes much earlier than they used to. That's particularly the case with Harlan and the Harlan properties, for example, as much of the fire risk is typically experienced in September and October. And so some of these producers have found that by picking a little bit earlier, not only will they have a little bit more freshness and acidity in their fruit, but they also reduce the risk of loss of grapes due to the fires. Now that you understand a little bit more about Napa and the growing conditions and the various AVAs, you also need to have a little bit of information about the labeling laws so that you can make an informed decision when you're purchasing wines from Napa Valley. The first thing you need to know is that if it says a particular variety on the label, that means that it has to have at least 75% of that grape variety in the bottle. So for example, if the bottle says Cabernet Sauvignon, that means that there has to be at least 75% Cabernet Sauvignon in that bottle of wine. If there's a blend of wine such that none of the grapes included in that bottling are 75% of the blend, then the wine will typically be labeled either red wine or perhaps the producer will come up with a proprietary name for that bottling. To use the name of a particular sub-AVA on the label, the wine has to include at least 85% fruit from that sub-AVA. And due to the conjunctive labeling laws, the bottling will have to have both the name of the sub-AVA and Napa Valley on it, for example. So if you're looking for a wine that comes from mountain fruit, you want to look for a name of one of the mountain sub-AVAs as well as Napa Valley on the label. Likewise, if you're looking for a wine that comes from the valley floor, you'll want to look for the name of a sub-AVA from the valley floor on that label, as well as the overarching Napa Valley AVA. One thing to note, however, if a wine just says Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, that could mean that the fruit comes from a particular area of Napa Valley that is not covered by a sub-AVA. But it could also mean that that producer is taking a blend of fruit from all over Napa Valley, 
Some producers, for example, think they can get the best of both worlds by blending mountain fruit with valley fruit, as you can get some structure and power from the mountain fruit, and you can get some softness and silkiness on the tannins from the valley fruit. If you're interested in specific wine recommendations for Napa Valley wines, visiting Napa Valley, or learning more about Napa Valley generally, be sure to check the links in the description below.